Hey everyone, welcome to Data Ingestion on Azure, real life scenarios and solutions. My name is Dustin Vano and I'll be talking through a very demo heavy approach to why we make certain decisions about uh, how we pull data from the source system and bring it into our data lake, data warehouse, lake house, whichever term you prefer there. So we won't focus so much on the end state, we'll focus a lot on the initial steps of data ingestion. I'll explain that a little more in just a moment here. Now, you're in luck because this is pre-recorded and I'm right here live with you in chat at the same time. So if you uh, aren't getting what you need, then start asking questions and we'll keep that going. And we'll have two, uh, two sessions going at once, basically the chat session and the streaming session right here. So um, here's our agenda for today. We'll talk about data pipelines and data ingestion briefly. We'll talk about ingesting from Azure storage and I'll dive into an example of that. We'll do ingestion from SQL Server. We'll ingest from Azure Event Hubs in a streaming fashion, and we'll ingest from uh, API. So these four different scenarios are all things that I've encountered uh, on the job in real scenarios. This is certainly a demo project that we'll be doing, um, but these are types of things that have led to different decisions. And I'll kind of explain some of the pros and cons of the decisions as we go, but it's not going to be a full-on technology introduction. It's really focused on uh, implementing these things in the real world. So uh, with that, I want to call out that we will use Azure Synapse a bit, particularly Synapse Pipelines and Synapse Spark. We will also use Azure Databricks for the later two demos, which will be uh, Spark and Azure Databricks and Spark Structured Streaming in Azure Databricks. So those are the main things, but then some of the supporting things that happen when we're dealing with data ingestion and data lakes uh, will be a part of this session as well. So just a quick place for you to see how to get in touch with me, and I'll show this contact info at the end as well. Um, I'm a data engineering consultant, so I do get to bounce around to different projects and work with different technologies. Um, I lead a data engineering San Diego meetup, and you can join that. You can find us on meetup.com, and we meet uh, virtually, uh, potentially hybrid coming soon. And so you can join us from anywhere in the world, really. Uh, the technologies I tend to work with are there on the, on the screen for you, just so that you know, but you'll get a good taste for that as we go through the session. So what is data ingestion? This is not going to take up a whole lot of time, but I do want to just backtrack a little bit to what I mean when I say data lake. Um, we won't really get into lake house, which is a combination, but a lot of these concepts that I'll talk about in the next two slides apply to both um, or apply across the board, even if you're in a lake house environment. So really a lake is a big data capable uh, platform for data analytics. Um, we want to break it up into data zones. I usually recommend uh, we have a raw zone, we have an enriched or refined zone, and then we have a certified or curated zone for the actual reporting and analytics would typically come from that curated zone. Data scientists and other um, uh, automated processes might be going to the raw layer, but you want to kind of keep that a little bit more protected because the data is less cleaned up and you also will need to do more processing and reloading of data in the raw zone, whereas you can be a little more careful about how much downtime you have during a reload in the curated or certified zone. And then a data lake would be ready for analysts to use. So um, you, you could just throw it all into a storage solution, but really you're typically expecting to have at least one, maybe several tools for querying that data. All right, so that brings us to data ingestion. And so data ingestion, this is my definition here, is the process of bringing data into a data lake or a data warehouse. So uh, this can mean things like cleaning and enriching and transforming the data, um, but it definitely, definitely means that initial get it from the source or get it from some place that you don't really control and pull it into the place that you now control. You can assign access if appropriate and you can uh, do additional transformation and things within that system that you ingest too. So that's what we're focusing on a lot is getting the data from the source system and bringing it in. I'll talk a little about, about going from the uh, initial like raw layer that you store it in to the next refined layer and then just a little bit of touching on that final certified curated layer but I won't be demonstrating the curated layer today. So as we look at more of a data pipeline, data pipelines more end to end. And so for a data pipeline, you'd be dealing with collecting, making the data available, cleaning it, enriching it, and curating that data. Curating basically being, maybe you, maybe you call it a common data model, maybe you call it a star schema or a dimensional model, but that final place that people are going to access the data from that has actually been thought about a lot, are we naming these things correctly? Are we organizing them correctly? Are we securing them correctly? So these, these are my, uh, my steps. There's different words you can flip, flip in there, right? You could just put transform as an item and, and cover enrich and clean together. Um, but these are basic ideas. And so in this session with ingestion, 
We're going to focus a lot on the collecting the data, ingesting it into our system, making it available for people to use by storing it into data lake storage in Azure. Uh, we'll talk a bit about where the cleaning and enriching might happen along the way. And we won't spend much time on the curated part, that final uh, clean data model that's ready to use. So now I wanna do a technology overview. We'll talk about the technology the whole way through. So you do just kind of have to hang with me if you wanna get um, kind of my thoughts on the different technologies we'll use, but let's cover some of the basics, the fundamentals before we go any further. And so another thing we'll be using, especially in the first couple of demos is Azure Synapse Analytics. Now it's a much broader topic than the pieces I'm focusing on today. So let's do the really, you know, one, two minute version of it. So what we have with Synapse Analytics, at least the things I'm calling out for you, that's, that's interested in data ingestion. We have managed Apache Spark, which will be something that I, that I show you. We have Synapse Pipelines, which I'll show you. And then Serverless SQL and Dedicated SQL, SQL are a couple of options for querying data with SQL uh, within your data lake or loading it as a data warehouse into Dedicated SQL. So just the, the slightly more drilled in version is that with Apache Spark, what we're really going to likely use that for is for data exploration and for data processing. Uh, I find that you can go to a certain level of data processing using Spark on uh, Synapse Apache Spark as it stands today. Uh, there's some things that it starts to become a little bit more challenging to do than other managed Spark environments in my experience. And I'll talk about those when I get to streaming really. Um, that'll continue to change by time you watch this. Maybe that's changed already. Um, but that's kind of where it stands today for basic processing, for things that are really integrated into uh, the, your Synapse environment. It's a good fit for doing data processing with Spark. And then serverless SQL is really good for querying and exp exploratory queries. And for, for queries that are gonna pull out data, as long as you don't, don't hit the limitations, which the limitations are pretty high, but there are limitations I've heard about. Um, as long as you don't hit the limitations, you can do a lot of querying directly on your Azure Data Lake storage that we'll use without having to load to another system. Now dedicated SQL is for when you, uh, you need that extra performance, you, you need to load that data to a very uh, purpose-built solution, a massive parallel processing database. Uh, and you probably want more than a terabyte of data if you're going to work with dedicated SQL. There's some things you're going to learn and read up on if you're working with dedicated SQL for the first time. A lot of it's similar to SQL Server, but the way it works um, has a little bit of overlap with things like Redshift or Google BigQuery, though all of them are very unique. And so <laughs> with dedicated SQL, that's a much deeper dive. Uh, discussion if you're going to use it, but you're going to pay more money for uh, running those SQL pools, and you're going to have to do a bit more thinking about how you organize and, and structure and, and keep the data ready to go with dedicated SQL. And then Synapse Pipelines is really meant for no code or low code data ingestion. You'll get to see that uh, pretty soon, and I'll describe that more as we go. Okay, so that's the high level Synapse Analytics. Let's talk about ingesting from Azure Storage. So the scenario I'm going to be focusing on is we have data in uh, source systems. In this case, uh, our source system is Azure Data Lake Storage. We have uh, Synapse Spark is the way I'm choosing to do this. And the, way, the reason I'm choosing to do Synapse Spark here is really, let me just tell you the real world environment I'm in. I've got uh, data engineers that know Apache Spark and know Python. They know one or the other or both already. I have the knowledge that there's going to be a lot of, and lot of processing that happens with data lake storage as the source. The data somehow got thrown into data lake storage or maybe even just Azure Blob storage, and I need to process from there. I want to come up with reusable code that uh, my, me and the other data engineers on the team can use. I want to make sure that I can do, um, I can do uh, code reviews where I'm saying, take this actual like Python code, this Spark code, compare it to what was there before and understand what's going on really quickly, really easily. I'm going to possibly use other libraries that I can import and not have to build too much myself. But I also wanna have the flexibility to do pretty much anything that my networking permissions will allow me to do. And that's where running um, PySpark, Python on, on Synapse Spark comes in. It really lets us do pretty much anything we're going to need to do. Gone are the days that I've experienced where we said, well, SSIS doesn't do that, therefore we can't do that as a data, data warehousing team. Uh, Synapse pipelines don't do that, therefore we can't do that. Um, granted, everything can be, uh, can be dy dynamically configured, customized for your use cases, I get that. But uh, I find Synapse Spark to be something that 
If you have a group of data engineers that's gonna deal with large data sets, at least some of the data sets are really large, maybe not every single one of them, Synapse Spark is a good way to go. And I may or may not convince you of that with this demo. Uh, let's talk about what Apache Spark is just to make sure we're all somewhat caught up. So Apache Spark really came about with the big transition to big data and big data tools. We wanted tools that scale easily as the data size grows. And so it is a fast general purpose data processing framework. Uh, it is simple code for distributed processing. And then it allows us to run it in quite a few different environments, Azure Synapse Spark being one environment. Databricks is another environment. You can run it on your own, spin up virtual machines, run it on Kubernetes, run it on Docker containers on your laptop, all sorts of options there. So what that means when we talk about um, sort of a big data platform, something that's going to do distributed computing, is that we have some sort of controller uh, node that's going to accept the code, accept the request, and it's going to break out as much as it can onto different worker nodes. So we're not going to try and uh, move everything from our house by ourselves. We're going to get a group of people to work together. You may need someone to give them directions on, hey, this thing goes here, that thing goes there, um, but they're gonna do a lot of the work uh, and, and make sure you split up the workload that way. That's the idea. Okay, so let's switch into the demo. And so in this demo, I'm ingesting data from Azure Storage. I sort of already said why I chose Apache Spark with the basic idea is that I want to do this programmatically. I wanna have reusable code and probably have a team that is expecting to use Apache Spark for quite a few things. And so we've got that skill set. We want to keep building on the, the knowledge and skills and libraries that we already have and know within Python and within Spark. So the data we'll use for all of these demos today is Stack Overflow data. Uh, I'll, I'll try and include some reference material on how do we get uh, Stack Overflow data. I have done some processing to get it into this somewhat easy to ingest state because when I was doing the Spark XML processing, uh, the code got a little bit crazy. And I didn't want you to focus on that because I've honestly never used Spark XML until I was prepping this demo. So we're gonna read some Parquet files from Azure Data Lake Storage that include all of the historical Stack Overflow data as it was you know, stored and maintained raw. And so this hasn't been processed and put in a data warehouse before. It also hasn't been updated in, I think a month or so now. Um, and so it's kind of our monthly dump. And we're gonna do this to basically call bootstrap or backfill our data sets. So real quick, I wanna share that you can get these resources at data kickstart, github.com slash data kickstart at my data ingestion examples repo. I'll be uploading them and as, as many of the resources, especially the notebooks, I'll get those uploaded so you can go and, and reference those or even try to follow along if you like. So here we are in Azure Synapse Studio where we'll come to do our development for the first couple of demos. And this first one, we're going to use Synapse Spark. And the way we'll get there is by going to the develop hub and then browsing in our notebook section. I've got mine organized by subject area. Uh, and so Stack Overflow and just ADLS will get us where we need to be. So I started up my session already. You can see it took just under four minutes to get going, um, but now we're ready to roll. I've got the uh, markdown up top to explain what I'm doing. I really recommend if you're trying to do uh, real reusable work that you're gonna you know, have a team working on, or you may have to come back and debug in you know, three months to a year, uh, put something at the top just about the basics of what's happening in this script. Okay, so the first things we're doing are just setting a source path, a raw path, and a refined path. So in this case, our source is this external ADLS environment. Even if it's within our company, it's not part of our data lake. And so the data that's sitting there isn't going to be available to our data scientist and other people that might need raw data from time to time. What we'll do is we'll um, specify our raw uh, container within our data lake storage account, and we will uh, go ahead and create a database and create some tables there. So from there, uh, one thing I want to show you that's important about a more realistic example, a little bit more than I do in a lot of my demos, is that I'm going to bring in some kind of utilities that help me with logging because it's really helpful. You know, once I start running this all the time, it's really helpful to go to log analytics and see what has been going on and, um, and kind of trace, you know, which jobs have run, how far did they make it, and you can store some different information in there. And so I, I pull in that utilities, which means there's a couple of logging uh, functions that I can use that are all connected. So I need to set up some different uh, variables in order to drive my logging and then start logging as my function that's going to kick everything off and give a nice message in my logs that say, hey, this job has started. I want to use reusable code if I'm doing something that's a production-like scenario. And so 
rather than um, put everything into just one cell, I've broken it out into just a couple of functions. These would probably go to a utils file, like a Spark utils file that I create and get used in multiple raw and refined uh, ingestion scenarios. But in this case, I just put them right here to save us jumping around too much. The first thing is a get table path. So I tried to describe it with a comment that's really a good practice to do for realistic scenarios. And um, basically though, what we're doing if we look at the code is we're going to use MS Spark Utils. It's this built-in Synapse Spark functionality to uh, go and uh, do things with the, uh, with the directory. And so I'm going to get back a list of file paths and uh, names, folder names or table names. Uh, and this piece here, if you're not, don't do a lot of Python, this is a Python, um, a Python list comprehension. And so I recommend that you um, eventually get familiar with these. It's basically a for loop all built into uh, a one liner. And so those, as you work with Python, a lot become a little more commonplace, but it is kind of tough to read, which is why I like to have documentation around uh, some of my functions so you know what's going to come out the other side. All right. So the other thing I'll do is a save table. Saving tables in Spark is actually pretty straightforward. You may choose not to bother making this a, a function, but I knew that I was going to save some things as parquet, some things with partitions, some without. And so I went ahead and just put this into one function that can be reused really in quite a few different scenarios with Spark. We're going to call the data frame, um, the Spark data frame, which has the data dot write. We're going to say overwrite mode all the time. This could be pushed up as a parameter as well if you need to make that more just adaptable. We have the uh, options as a dictionary so we can pass all those in as Spark options. So any options that are applied to a data frame write could be applied right here. Uh, and then we specify the format, again, delta or parquet. So if there's partitions provided, if there's a string that looks something like this with one or two or maybe a few more column names in a, in a delimited form, that will go ahead and add this partition clause to the statement. Uh, with or without the partition clause, though, it's going to call spark save as table. With the, the table will come in with the, both the database and the table, database.table format. So that's how we're going to do a save. So if we look real quickly and run this, run this command here, uh, we are going to create the database if it doesn't exist, and we're going to um, go and get that list of tables from our source path. This is the kind of the ADLS account that is not uh, part of our data lake. So when we run that, um, I went ahead and printed the table list. You can see that we've got uh, a list of tuples. So each item I'm going to loop through will have the path first and then the, the name, the folder name or table name is what we'll really use it as. So here's my for loop that takes advantage of that. I loop through the table, I extract the path and the table for each item in the list. Then I call save table, pass in that data frame, pass in my database and table, and then I'm saving it as parquet so that it's available in serverless SQL. Finally, I'm going to log that I created that table. So we'll go ahead and run this and we'll come back and just see it uh, completed at the end. So uh, I'll also need to create my refined database and make sure that's all set up and ready to go. And then in this case, I'm going to use that same code to get the table list, but I'm gonna get it from the raw path instead of the, the source path. And so we've already saved as parquet in the raw path, potentially we've added a few things. So in my example, I just wanted a complete copy. Uh, I'll read that data in. And again, I'll do a for loop off of that data, that list of tables. I'll do the same kind of read from parquet. And here's where I'll do some transformation. So after we do whatever transformations we do, we'll save the table. Again, I'm using the same sort of function, but this time I'm saving as delta just so that I can uh, use some of the capabilities of Delta uh, and I'll have to go create separate serverless views on top of it if anyone's going to query Refine directly. Uh, honestly, I would try to keep, keep people out of Refine except for our automated scripts. Um, but that being said, uh, you, you may have to let some people in there and they may really need serverless SQL. You can even use serverless SQL to do some of the processing and things that'll that'll fill into the final level of like a curated database that people are actually going to build the reports on top of. Again, I'll do some logging at the end of that step. And then at the end, I'll run a stop log, which will tell, tell myself in the logs that the job is done and do some calculation of how long this thing ran for. So this is still running. We'll go ahead and skip ahead, see the timings and, and wrap up in just a moment after I fast forward here. Okay, so that one finally finished. Um, it really did move quite a bit of data with that post table, but it still, you know, took a good 12 minutes there. Let's go ahead and jump down to the final refine step, run that and just see how long it takes. The main thing I want to share is that if we want to run this a bit faster, 
uh, what we can do is we could actually, instead of doing a for loop that's going to submit each of these Spark readers and writes uh, sequentially, we could use a little bit of Python concurrency to uh, submit multiple at once, maybe you know three or four at once in this case. And then we can see that it took uh, 12 minutes for that step to complete as well. So like I said, uh, it really would be beneficial to speed this up by using some concurrency. But the other thing we'd probably do that I'm not showing in this step, I'll show you another way to do it in, in demo two, is set this up as a, a delta ingest for the post table because it really doesn't change all the time. And then finally, the stop logging step runs and uh, logs that the job's complete and how much time it took. The next example I want to talk through is ingesting data from SQL Server. And so we're going to, I'm not going to ingest it from Azure SQL, which is a really easy way to run databases within Azure. But uh, I also want you to think about what if this was an on-premises SQL Server or is in some other cloud where the, the network is completely cut off from Azure and I can't use the easy connectivity options I have to connect uh, secure networks within Azure. So um, when it comes to that type of networking situation, I tend to go to Synapse Pipelines as much as I can. The way I'll do it is I'll use Synapse Pipelines, uh, which is a low-code ETL development um, you know, toolkit. It lets me it lets me either use like kind of these wizard type views like I'll use to build out a copy activity or a set of copy activities, or I can go into mapping data flows and say, hey, pull the data from here, add this type of uh, transformation to this column, look up this data here, and kind of build, build out what it looks like visually uh, with a web portal. It allows us to do serverless processing so we can kind of control our costs a little bit, but also scale out really easily without having to Think about servers and contact our infrastructure team to, to set stuff up. And then the self-hosted runtime is really what gets me to that, um, into that other network that's, that's separate from my uh, Azure network. And so self-hosted runtime is where I, I set up a virtual machine or some kind, of, some kind of compute environment, and I run the self-hosted runtime, integration runtime software on it. And I give that network connectivity, make sure that IP is whitelisted if needed, and now anything that runs on that box has connectivity to the source system. And so what I can do there is I can set up, um, instead of the auto-resolve integration runtime in Synapse Pipelines, I choose self-hosted. That's going to do the work. I just need to scale up that self-hosted you know, virtual machine or whatever it is to the right size to, to meet my needs. And so it does take a little bit of thinking about the server and scaling it out at that point. Now, if you have a self-hosted runtime, once you get that data ingested and, and stage it into your data lake, then you can start to use um, the serverless processing capabilities from there. So if you build a bunch of stuff with Synapse Pipelines, uh, you may use a self-hosted runtime just for getting a few pieces of information out of private networks and use uh, auto-resolve runtime for the rest of it, unless your security team has a problem with that for, for various reasons. So let's get into the demo where I'm ingesting from SQL Server. Mine will be Azure SQL, just pretend it's on-premises, pretend I'm using self-hosted runtime just because that's the, the real-world scenario I want to uh, portray here, um, but I didn't want to set up a VM and everything this time. So uh, what you'll see though is I'm pulling stack overflow data. This has been processed a little bit differently than the raw files that I ingested earlier. So it's gonna be very similar data, a lot of the same column names and things. And at some point we'll need to kind of merge and consolidate these before they go to that final certified or curated uh, zone within our data lake. Um, but this is really just focused on the ingestion piece. So you'll see us coming from SQL Server. And what we'll be trying to do is uh, get a little bit more parallelization using Synapse Pipelines, um, which is gonna keep this um, at an appropriate amount of appropriate speed for if we were going to do this as a regular recurring job. So let's dive into that. Okay, so to do this Synapse pipeline, to do the copy, we're here in Synapse Studio. We can go down to the integrate section and we can go ahead and um, create that with the copy data tool option there. Okay, so I'm going to do metadata driven copy task. And this, I think this is a really great way to get your thing created in the first place you probably will um, need to go adjust it. And you, I actually like to simplify it, take out some of the levels if it's not too large of a, of a job. Um, and, but I do think it's a great way to get started and help us to show some of these capabilities that Synapse Pipelines will give you. So for the control table, I don't care too much about the name of that. You just need something you can keep track of. We'll leave that by the default for now. And we'll choose run once. We can always schedule it later. So now is where we need to set up our data store. If you're dealing with SQL Server on-premises or in another cloud, you may wanna use the SQL Server option here and choose that. Um, otherwise, if you're in Azure like I am, we can use Azure SQL. Note that when you're setting up SQL Server, this is where that self-hosted integration runtime 
would need to be used if you have a VM with special networking uh, considerations in order to access the data. In my case, we're going to skip that step and focus in on the rest of this copy data activity that we'll set up. So I need to give this a name. I'll call it Stack Overflow Test. Call it test two, just in case there's something else sitting out there. And then I need to provide the information about what the server is. I need to set up the database. So if I go down, I'm going to parameterize this. So in the parameter section, I can add a parameter such as database name, and I can give it a default value. Okay, now that I've set that up, uh, instead of hard coding this database name for this connection, I can go ahead and use that parameter. It'll default to the one that I want for this example, but I can always set up parameters that pass it in differently in the future. Now for my uh, username, uh, you could also do this in a dynamic way. I'm going to just hard code it so we can keep moving now that you've seen how you set up those dynamic parameters. For my password, I'm gonna try not to store that here within Synapse Pipelines. I like to use Key Vault for that. You should have at least one linked Key Vault uh, in a Synapse workspace and then you need to find the correct key. I think uh, this key here is going to get us through. So this is a secret within Key Vault where I put the password. It's just gonna grab the latest version and let's see if this is ready to go. If you're using a serverless database like I am, do make sure that it's turned on right now. Uh, otherwise it, it may not be able to connect. Um, good, everything's ready to go on that step and we can commit and now we've got our source. The next thing it'll do is prompt me for which tables from that source I want to copy over. And often it's almost all of them. And so I'll go ahead and just select all. There's a seven or eight here. And then I can choose whether I want to do a full load from SQL Server for each one, a full ingest of that data, or if I need to do some incremental loads or delta loads for certain tables. In my case, a couple of these are actually pretty big. Well, one of these is the biggest though. So let's focus on just posts for our delta load example. And I'll set up delta load. Uh, when you're doing a delta load, you need some sort of column to do that on. Date's a common example. If you have a nice sequential ID, you might be able to use that. Um, I don't know for sure if that's going to be sequential all the time. And so I'm going to use the use creation date to kind of break this out into different batches. And then I'll set up um, the start date. And for my example, I think I'll go all the way back to 2010. You probably want to think about this a little bit harder than I am. Let's do 2009. Why not? Uh, you probably want to think about this a little bit harder in your real example, but we'll just pick a date that's somewhere in the past to start with. And what it's going to do is when it's done running this first load, it will track the latest date we loaded, and that'll be where it kicks off the next time. So it's only, only going to track new posts that happen. All right. Uh, the other things that I want to point out is that you can, if you really need to scale this out better, you can set up a partition and read multiple connections to the server, kind of split it out that way based on a partition column. Here's where ID is probably a really good partition column to use. Uh, it just kind of gets more and more complex as you add these things on, but it gives you more, more knobs to turn to try and tune the performance here. So all of that looks okay to me and I will go ahead and continue on. Okay, for the destination store, I'm going to send it to Azure Data Lake Storage. Again, there's, there's typically a link service uh, and connection available to you already for that, but you may have to define that. I need to set the folder path and I'm gonna include the container name in the folder path here. Okay, so I've got my own SQL history folder that I'll write this data to. And then I'm actually not going to use text files, I'm going to use parquet. So I'll go ahead and change that suffix here and we'll set a little more about that in a moment. So here it's, it's recognized that I wanna do parquet and so it's got parquet set with snappy compression. I have completely fine with those options. Uh, I can set up a table prefix name, or sorry, a task prefix name for what it creates. Uh, I'll go ahead and call it the uh, Stack Overflow Copy Task. Uh, and then uh, concurrency is something you'll wanna think about. I'm gonna keep mine relatively small, but make sure that we run multiple at the same time. So I'll set my concurrency to four. I'll set my advanced settings, my data integration units to be pretty small as well. Let's say maybe it can go up to 16. And then copy parallelism, parallelism I'll also set to four. 
So at this point, when I click next, I can go ahead and review what I did, make sure everything's good, make sure I like the names. And uh, then I have the choice to download the SQL scripts and set up the actual tables that are needed for this metadata driven copy. I can also then go to it and uh, go into debug mode. So I'm going to have to create these tables. I download the script, I'll go do that really quickly. Right when we're done with that, we'll come back and run the pipeline. Okay, so I just opened both tables. I've got them on this sandbox to SQL, which is where I said uh, the copy task should look for them at. Go ahead and get these created. Maybe one thing to note is that the way it sets up all of these tables that I told it to copy is it has this JSON information that it's going to go and save in the control table. So one of the many ways to run it is to go into debug mode. And so we'll just click on debug mode on our new copy task. We'll leave the default settings, which kind of control how much it'll run and how much it'll run at once. And we'll see if it can go and do its thing. You may have noticed, if not, let me show you that we start with this top level task. It actually created three different tasks for us. The top level task is going to figure out how many objects we have to deal with and then break it out among as many uh, subtasks that are needed. And so this is really a way to kind of control the scalability and, and break out the workload. For us. So the top level will end up calling the middle level. The middle level will call a certain number of the bottom level. And the bottom level will do the actual processing. If you're new to Synapse Pipelines, the thing that really makes this possible is this for each. Um, so you can set a batch count here and actually um, call the for each directly, basically, if you start to customize this and set how many you want to run at a time. In this case, the middle layer is going to. Uh, make all the calls and divide it into groups for us. Let's take a look and see uh, whether or not we've made some progress there, and then we'll kind of skip forward and see the final state. There we go. It's completed now. We can see that it, the whole thing didn't take too long. It took about nine minutes. Uh, and then the thing, because we did the delta load, we also know that it will not take that long the next time it runs. Uh, so that's kind of how you would do that uh, Synapse pipeline with all the copy tasks. Uh, and uh, like I said, I'd probably go customize it a bit from there to make it a little simpler to understand. Okay, I debated about which order to show these next two in, but we're going to start with event streams. So let's go ahead and look at what does it look like to ingest from event streams. You have, like most technologies, there's a lot of options that you can choose from. Uh, what I'm going to choose, what I'm going to recommend is that we take that Spark knowledge that my team has and we use it for doing stream processing as well. You can do this on Azure Synapse. Um, the main thing that I struggle with with Azure Synapse is it's a little bit tougher for me to get the right libraries and versions uh, all, all synced up on Azure Synapse. I don't have as much control. Uh, the other thing that I, I like about Databricks over Synapse when it comes to streaming is that I, uh, I can keep my cluster running longer. I don't have as much concern about the cluster uh, turning off on me. Um, yeah, I just, I just have a little more control and I think it's a little more built for these long running jobs, long running clusters at this point in time. Again, these things change quickly, but that's kind of where we're at. All right. So with that, this is what our pipeline would probably look like. We have data coming from somewhere into event hubs. The truth is as a, a database data engineer, data developer, I don't always know where the data comes from that makes it into event hubs. I usually, I usually have an idea, right? But I may not know whether it's a SQL Server box or a Postgres. I just know that this team in the organization is publishing events to event hubs for me to consume. <clears throat> now, either the team is going to document somewhere for me what the, the payload looks like, what the contract is of the data, each record that they send to event hubs, or I'm going to need to have like a schema registry where they register what the schema is, or I just grab a little bit of it and figure it out myself, which unfortunately tends to be the case, but it's not the best way to do it. If you can get someone to tell you what the scheme is, that'll save you uh, some missteps along the way. So data streaming real time or near real time or really whatever they choose, but it can be near real time to event hubs. And then we have a job on Databricks that's going to run really often, like every five seconds, maybe even less than that, kick off every five seconds process and, and drop some data into data lake storage. So if you're using Azure Event Hubs or why you would use Azure Event Hubs rather is because it's a scalable message broker. Uh, we can just pump a bunch of data at it and it can keep up with it. The other thing that's awesome about it is it decouples the producer of the data from the consumer of the data. So we, the data engineering team are the consumers and 
Uh, wouldn't it be nice if someone just send us the data we need in a format that's appropriate, uh, name things the way they should, maybe do some of the, the rules get applied upstream potentially? Uh, wouldn't that be wonderful? And we don't really have to know much about it. We just get this, uh, what they think is the right data set for their data that they own. They're the, they're the source of it. We get that and we can just consume it and do things with it from there. So um, what that means is that the producer can be sending this data that they think is right for all of the organization. We, the data engineering team, can be consuming that data and others can be consuming that data as well without a bunch of, hopefully without a bunch of meetings and discussion unless that contract of what the scheme is going to look like changes. So if they switch from one SQL server to another, I don't care. As long as they're sending to the right event hub environment, I'm in good shape. Apache Kafka compatibility is something I really like about event hubs because I've spent um, more years working with Apache Kafka than I have in event hubs. And so I can use uh, the Apache Kafka 1.0 protocol and get away with a lot of the, the Kafka tools that I would use by connecting them to event hubs. I can even use the Kafka um, Spark APIs, which is what I'll actually use in this example. And then we're going to auto scale our, um, our event hubs by setting up at the namespace level. So up to 10 event hubs fit in a namespace at this point. Uh, I can say, hey, here's how much power I want this to have. Start at one, go up to, I don't know, 10, 20, something like that, uh, in order to keep up with the workload as things go up and down, as things up and flow, as people are in pushing data to Kafka and as I'm ingest or to event hubs and as I'm ingesting it from event hubs. So at the top of this diagram, I have producers, I have trip data and vendor data as two separate boxes coming into uh, Azure event hubs. And then I have multiple consumers at the bottom, like my data lake consumer, which is, which is me in this case. My real-time report, which may or may not be me as well, but it's a whole different uh, application and use case. And then my user dashboard. And in this case, I'm thinking like on the website, we are showing people, hey, here's the latest trip you took. Um, that goes in their user dashboard. Uh, that doesn't necessarily need to go through the data lake and through the different processing that I'll be doing to it in order to make it on the user dashboard. Okay, so Spark structured streaming. We've, we've seen Spark just a little bit. This isn't a deep dive on any of these things, but what I want to call out is that it's a way of thinking about um, dealing with streaming data and streaming analytics without really thinking too much about streaming. So we're going to picture that we have this table in the background that's just constantly getting updated with new records. And we're going to have to make some decisions on, do I just want the latest records to, co to come out the other side of my pipeline? Do I want to send a complete re-aggregated re data set out the other side? Uh, do I want to update things that have already been, um, been pushed out? That kind of thing. But that's the idea though, is like, I don't have to think too hard about streaming. I still get this distributed capability that Spark provides. I can also reuse a lot of libraries that I use within Apache Spark uh, with, with batch jobs because Spark streaming and batch have a lot in common. Uh, usually if you change out the source and the sync, a lot of the transformation in the middle could be the same. So now I'm gonna show you the event stream ingestion. And so we'll use Azure Event Hubs, we'll use Databricks to run Spark on, and then really Spark structured streaming is the main thing I'm highlighting here. Okay, so here we are in Azure Databricks to do our streaming demo. Uh, we'll start with uh, running this whole notebook and we'll talk through it as it starts to go. We also need to produce a few events. So without getting into all the details, I'm gonna run my event producer notebook as well. Basically taking some files uh, from that data I loaded from the monthly files and just producing it as if it's new data, just to simulate this. Okay, so we do some imports and things, including our logs. We're still gonna do a little bit of logging in here. Uh, the uh, topic name is Stack Overflow Post, so that's the name of my event hub. Now I use a group ID just to specify whether or not this application I'm running now is tied to any other applications that are running, basically to help me keep track of what I've already consumed and if anything else is trying to consume it at the same time. Uh, I won't get into defining these event hub configs. I do have some videos on YouTube and other conference sessions where I talk a little bit more about it, but there's the code example for those that need to do this yourself. Okay, so past the configuration there, we do need to define the schema of the message since I'm sending JSON data. If you use schema registry, there's some different calls you'd need to make. Um, but in this case, I'm just going to define the schema here. Basically what I did is I read a sample of the file and uh, did a Spark into a Spark data frame and did a print schema and then converted it into this syntax where I'm adding each field with a Spark data type as I go. The next piece is to actually grab that config using the method we looked at a moment ago. And then uh, for those that were, were following along with the batch or with Spark, we're going to do read stream instead of just a read. That's how we know we're in streaming mode. We need to specify a format and Kafka is available for us. And then I pass in all those configs uh, as a, 
uh, unpack that and get all those options set so that it knows where I'm trying to read from and, and my authentication and all that stuff. And then dot load is going to get me uh, further along as we go. Uh, next, we transform this data. So a Kafka record actually comes with um, several values included. And so the partition, the offset, the timestamp um, come through automatically. I take the key. That's really important. And I know that I've uh, serialized this as a string. And so I convert it uh, to, uh, to a string type instead of the, the byte that it's going to come through as. Values still bytes. I'm going to do that in the next piece here. In the next piece where I'm parsing, I... I have a field I add that's just the value as a string instead of bytes. And then more importantly, I add this JSON where I'm doing from JSON on the value as a string. Take that string JSON, um, parse it out so I can then start to reference individual elements. In order to read the JSON using from JSON function, I need that schema. And so this is the Spark schema I, I built up above and I'm passing it now. So now to take from a single column in the data frame that that has all these uh, elements available through calling a JSON dot whatever, I'm going to do JSON dot start to unpack them all into a column per attribute is really what we're doing here. So now I've got a data frame called DF post, and I can kind of look that the schema looks something like this. Whereas prior to that with uh, parsed, I had a value string and then JSON as a single field, and I would have to then call out each item within that field before. Right, so we've got a nice flat table of this JSON. There might still be a few nested structures in there, but in this case, I think it is pretty flat. So quick aside, so that's reading the post data that's being sent. Now, before we kick this all off, we need to get in some data to join to. And so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna combine some new user data that's gonna be more up to date. I'm probably hitting this every, I'd have to do it pretty frequently to make sure that as a user gets created, I have them available. And once they do their first post, let's say, I've already got them in my system before they do that first post. So this is something that's gonna, this new users table get loaded all the time. I'll, I'll show you how we can do that from API as an example. And then I'm gonna read that historical data. So if my new users is only a subset of newer uh, users that have been added, the historical will load up all the his history of users for me. And that history won't really change. New users will just get tagged on as things happen. So I take those two data frames, I make sure they have the same format and, and column names, and I union them together. So one data frame dot union, the other data frame, new users being the second one in this case, gives me my all users data frame. So with that, now we're to the final piece of the puzzle here. We're going to take that post data frame I, I've got. It's really a streaming data frame at this point. I'm going to join it to all users. This is how you can do a join in PySpark. I'm going to give it a condition of owner user ID equals user ID and all users. And then I need to say whether it's an inner join or a left join. Then uh, I have checkpoints that I'll define a path for, and I have the destination path that I get defined. So then finally, I, I do a little log message to show what's going on. And then I'm going to call my data frame dot write stream. So instead of just write, like we did in batch mode, we're doing a write stream. Uh, I can do Delta here. I could send to Kafka. If I'm going to send to two different locations within the same job, within the same application, I would probably do a data frame dot for each batch and then call out individual batch writes there. Otherwise, if I have multiple write streams in the same job, it's gonna end up creating separate streams for each, which may not be too bad. It's just a little more disconnected, probably not gonna perform quite as well for you. All right, so I'm writing to Delta in this case. I'm writing to a file very frequently, which means I'll have to go back and make sure I run optimize and clean up those files into much larger files uh, pretty regularly, really, if I'm doing every 30 seconds here. Checkpoint is to store my, basically how far I've processed in my offsets within Event Hub. So how much of the data in Event Hubs have I already processed? Where did I leave off so that when this thing does stop, because at some point it'll stop, even if it runs for a week before it, before it stops, uh, I wanna make sure I pick up at the right spot when I restart this thing. Uh, I've set my trigger time to 30 seconds, so not ridiculously fast, but by most analytics standards, we're still pretty real time if we can get this data pushed through in about 30 seconds. Under a minute is usually a pretty good bet for a lot of analytics solutions. Often, if you really push it, you know, you can go a lot longer than just a minute, but a minute's a pretty good baseline. Um, and then I've got this append output mode, and I can start this up and tell it where to write that data to. So once start runs, that's really where this all kicks off and starts to do it thing, its thing. You can see I've got it set to just continuously run. I don't have anything to stop it in the end. 
If I did want to run as a one-time example, I should be able to do a command very similar, if not exactly, to what I have down here next to my logging stop. Uh, in this case, I do want to keep it running, though. I want to keep producing, keep this thing running. I would probably look at how I schedule this as a, as a job instead of actually running this all the time if this is a long-term event stream that'll be running. But the nice thing about having it as a notebook, especially for like testing, building it, examples, is I can just attach it to a cluster that other people are using and run the stream on it. I don't have to have my own job cluster just for a stream if I've got enough use cases that, that fit together. So if you're gonna have a cluster on all the time, you're gonna have enough bandwidth to run multiple things, you can just have that stream running on that cluster. Otherwise, create a job cluster, which is going to be cheaper for you, kick that thing off, and you'll probably need to build some sort of status check and retry logic to make sure that it, it keeps running all the time and it doesn't stop on you without alerting you that it's done. So with that, we've kind of walked through how we do streaming within Spark Structured Streaming. Just to prove that something has happened, I can go and read that same Delta file that I'm writing to. And I could even stream off of Delta. I could do a read stream and keep going off of Delta. I haven't built production scenarios where I am streaming from Delta, but it says it's supported. I've done it in plenty of demos. Um, I usually would go to Kafka or Event Hubs if I'm planning to do a lot more streaming with the output of my first stream. So there we go. We've got our data. It should join to user at the end here, and we're in good shape. Okay, the next section is about what if we're ingesting data from an API. Uh, and this is actually kind of a weird uh, way to do it, but uh, honestly, there's a, there's a common need to get data from API. And as a data engineer, I think it's good to know how to do it. Um, you can do it with Python and run it not, not inside the Spark environment. Let's say you have an API where you're going to be getting um, a pretty manageable set of data each time that you can put into memory and process, a Python request library like we'll use, but then putting the data into pandas instead of of Spark and running it, maybe as an Azure function if it runs infrequently enough, uh, maybe on top of Kubernetes, uh, maybe as a container app. Like there's a lot of options to run Python code outside of Spark. But let me be real. I've got a group of data engineers. We're doing a ton of stuff with Spark. We're going to join data that we've already loaded with Spark in the data lake at some point from this API. And so I might choose to run a small job on my Spark environment um, that is that is using Python request library, using Spark for just a little bit of data processing and to have that same interface to save the data and make sure it's saved exactly how uh, my Spark library tends to save the code. So let's, let's get hands on with this and take a look at how we do this within Spark. And we can keep talking in the chat if you like about how we could do it in all these other environments that um, if you have an SRE that can deploy those for you and help you get those wired up, a lot of good reasons to do that. If you don't, if you're a group of data engineers doing this on your own, trying to make things happen, you've got a Spark environment. It's, you, can, you can configure it to where it's not going to cost you that much money to hit an API from Spark. And then you still got the benefit of using the Spark API for some things, even if it's a small data set. Hopefully that's enough description. But like I said, I'm available in chat to keep talking through this. Let's dive into the demo. Okay, so here we are in a Databricks notebook where we'll first use a little Python to call APIs. And we'll mix some Spark in there as well. There's a very really small data set, and so I'm running on a single node cluster with the smallest node size possible. Uh, I make a few assumptions here that expect not to have more than, I don't know, a couple hundred records in the mix. Um, so, so that's just kind of something to keep in mind is that if you were going to expect a large amount of results from the first API call I'll show you, you probably need to change up how you do the second API call. For those API calls, though, I'm going to use a Python library called Request. This is the place I'd recommend you start if you are new to API calls within Python. It's the place, it's what I always use. So that's my recommendation. I also have a utils, logging utils and Databricks. And so I'm actually in the repository mode of Databricks. And so I've got this utils folder. I've got a logging library that's a, a Python script instead of a notebook. And so instead of running a notebook like I did in Synapse, I'm just importing it here. Now we're going to um, need to start our logging like we always do and set a few different uh, endpoints that we'll use in the next step. Okay, so here's kind of the core of how we call the Stack Overflow API. I'm going to essentially build up a list of tags and this is inclusive and so I'm doing just one tag to get as many results as I can for a small window for us. So just PySpark, which is what I care the most about, let's say. With the request library, request.get is a way to say, hey, do an HTTP get call. The other thing to know is that I've got to check whether or not I get a 200 back. Uh, you may have a range that you wanna work with. I think for this API, I'm 
pretty safe just saying if it's 200 work with it otherwise i'll end up getting an error and raising that up which i don't really have a lot of error handling built in because i want to keep this a little bit focused on the point which is how do i call apis so this is how we'll get our questions from stack overflow the basic idea is let's say i'm running this every every hour or a couple hours to say what are the new questions today let me get those because the files i loaded earlier are just a monthly load now, the other thing I'm going to want is that my users list prob may not have all the users that have posted questions. And so instead of relying on my possibly a month old or 30 days old data that I, that I got via file earlier, I'm going to actually go and say, hey, for each of these, go ahead and get the user involved as well. Since I'm running this frequently and getting a small list, uh, I'll show you we're just going to build up a, a string of user IDs. And we could add in some logic that say if the list is a certain size, break it out into chunks, right? You can get a little more complicated with this uh, depending on how much data you'll work with. I've got some logger debug calls in here uh, as well. Um, those, I don't do a lot of these in my actual code, but uh, it's kind of a practice that's worth knowing about if you want to make sure you see what's going on as you're testing this out. So uh, with that, I know there's all kind of a bunch of code route all together, but really the key is that I build up this query string that I append to my endpoint which is that I want the Stack Overflow users only. I'm building up a user list. This is a little Python code here that says take a, it's gonna be a, a, a set or a list. I'll make sure it's converted to a list of strings. Each string represents a user ID and I need to make them uh, semicolon delimited. So this semicolon join says, hey, insert a semicolon between all the values in this list and just make one long string. Um, that's a little Python tip for you if you haven't seen that one before. Same idea, I'll do some kind of error handling if I don't get a 200 back. Otherwise I return the stuff I care about, the text I get back. So here we are down in uh, some of my actual code that's going to run. And so I'm going to specify, get, take the current timestamp, subtract this amount of time from it, and uh, build up my string that way when I call questions. So I call get questions with the endpoint, the from date, and the to date, right? Now I'm going to get this response back I'm going to take that text and load it up as JSON. I actually think I could call JSON here, but um, because when I get errors, I deal with text, I've kind of just left it that way for now. I'm going to then um, grab just the items in that list. So there's some metadata and some interesting stuff. I'm gonna pull out just the items, build a list of the stuff I care about basically. I do a little debugging, uh, log out the metadata down here. Don't really worry about this part. Um, but the most important part is I'm setting this list of values I care about. And there's like a list of uh, JSON text, basically, or JSON values. Um, now, down here, I printed out what that question looks like. So we can see I got 12 questions uh, related to PySpark for the time period I was looking at. And this uh, or index of zero just says, give me the first item in the list. And so you can see there's some tags. Uh, there's an owner, owner information with a user ID, which comes to play next. And a bunch of other info about the question they asked, including the actual like HTML content, if I want to parse that and do something with it. So here next, I'm going to actually create a data frame out of that. So I've got a list of values that uh, look like JSON objects. I believe they're Python dictionaries at this point. And I'm going to go ahead and create my data frame. And so I've run that and we have um, just the first few, few uh, pieces of the data frame showing, few records showing. And I can see the same kind of values in a data frame view. So coming down, what I kept finding is that if I go try and join to my already monthly created user dimension, I'm not finding any results, I think, at least not very many when I try this. So the next piece I'll do, this is a Spark thing where I do a, a collect from that data frame. So I'm gonna pull back all those rows that Spark worked with uh, back into my driver. Uh, if you are aware of Spark, you probably know that. Uh, you know, I took a small list of dictionaries, I went and use spark with it and then i pulled it back uh, right away so it's probably not optimal unless you have a lot more transformations and things to do like i said if you have a lot of data which is typically why you want to use spark uh, you'd probably want to keep going and figure out how you can use spark a little more efficiently than what i'm doing right here however these concepts i think are going to be uh, useful to you in real examples so now i come down and i uh Go ahead and I build up a set just so a set in Python will make sure it's unique. So I can go add each user ID from the questions uh, to that set. Make sure I don't get the same one twice because I don't need to go look at the same one, one up twice. Uh, and then uh, after that, let's go ahead and run this. I think I had different code in there last time I ran it. Um, so now I've got this nice clean list of IDs that I've made strings so that my 
user function will handle it properly. So here we are, we're getting there now. Uh, we have the get users that I talked about at the beginning is called. This is what's actually hitting the API and bringing some results back. So it could all blow up right here if I don't have that uh, endpoint call right or if I send bad values in my user list. I go ahead and take the text I get back, load it up as JSON with this json.loads call. I do a, um, a list again where I say, just give me the items. I don't want any metadata or other stuff that comes along with it. And then I'm going to show you an example just so you can kind of see what the raw uh, record kind of looks like here. This is a single user record. Uh, and what we'll do now, um, so I'm thinking about a couple examples. I'm not building any of them end to end at the moment in this demo. One example is that I want to get these new users, union them to my existing either monthly or daily users that I get and make sure that they're included in some of my real time type work I do, right? What I'm gonna do is I'm going to save the, the data um, to my refined layer. It's only a little bit cleaned up to be honest with you, but I'm going to start joining it to everything else. So I kind of want to have it in refined at that point. Uh, and I'm gonna save it as Delta just because I probably would go and change this append to some sort of um, Delta merge where I maybe don't do anything if I see the same record twice or I update all the fields if I see the same user again. Uh, so that's um, the reason I'd use Delta is because I'd want to go and do an upsert type of logic instead of just appending if I built this out a little more. Okay, so I save it. I've displayed it so we can talk about it. Here is what a user record looks like. I could go look at the creation date and try and see if the reason I can't find these users really is because they were created um, since June when I got my last uh, file load, or maybe there's something else I was doing wrong before. Um, and I have plenty of information about users, way more than I really have a plan to work with. But if you're doing some kind of um, recommendations or, or filtering based on user interest, uh, that stuff would start to come into play most likely. So finally, I'm going to join the questions and the user together. So right here is an example of a Spark join on this line. After that, I'll write that data down. Again, I'm going to uh, refine. I'm creating a, probably a really specific table since this is uh, hitting the API. And I've also got these like monthly batches, but a really specific table with newer data that's already been joined and is ready for more um, real time or at least, you know, up to date today type of uh, analysis. I've displayed that for you. There's really nothing too crazy to see, but I'll scroll through so you can see that. We've got all the stuff that came with question and then somewhere in here, we'll see it switch over right around where it shows account ID, I believe, and we'll start to see that user information all in one big data frame. Finally, just to show that we can query that data set, I wrote this little select statement uh, hitting the Delta table directly by the path. And um, once again, we're looking at the same data I just showed on the data frame, but we could start to filter and do things uh, right here as soon as we finish loading it. There's one example of using Python with APIs, uh, bringing in a Spark data frames, doing a bit of joining and saving it in our refined layer so that we're closer and closer to exposing that for queries like Power BI or for data science uses. Okay, we've made it through my simulated real world scenarios of data ingestion. We started with um, some quick definitions. We talked about how do I get this data from Azure Storage, which is the easiest way possible, but I chose Apache Spark because I think it's a really good way to build reusable code. And I think it's something you're going to want to use with much larger files than what I showed you. Um, but it, and it's also really um, built well into Synapse or into Azure Databricks. You kind of have some choices there. We looked at Synapse pipelines and how I might use that for a copy task that's a metadata driven dynamic uh, copy task. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do with Synapse pipelines that aren't covered, but there's other sessions that will talk about that. So go check those out if you want to learn more and, and go down that path more so than the Spark path. Uh, then we looked at what if I have streaming data and I chose Apache Spark again, surprise, surprise that, that me, Dustin chose Apache Spark, but that's usually what I go to. Um, but I really do like it for streaming. And we did that with Azure Databricks just so I have a little more control of my clusters, uh, a little bit easier to control libraries, things like that. And then finally, I showed you an API example and how we could ingest that using Python, how we could make that into a Spark data frame, especially if we have a large data set or need to join it to a large data set. Uh, and that brings us to the end here where you can continue to ask questions in chat and I'll support them. Big thanks to Microsoft for supporting this, uh, this conference here. Big thanks to you for joining and there's ways for you to win prizes. So um, uh, do what you need to do to win some prizes here. Why not? Always good to win prizes. And then if you have follow-up questions for me, you can uh, follow me on LinkedIn to see new blog posts and videos. Follow me on YouTube to see blog posts and videos. 
you can hit me up with questions in those channels and I try to try to get back and answer the ones I can answer. Um, and I'm also on Twitter and you can go see my website and see all the stuff I've done in the past all in one place for you. So really appreciate you taking the time to listen to me today. I hope this has been helpful in your journey. Continue to keep in touch as we go. Thank you.